Hi everyone, so today's lecture is on antimicrobial drugs and antibiotic resistance. And this is quite an important lecture because any of you planning on going to the medical field or even in your own personal lives and the lives of your loved ones, it's important to really understand this chapter because it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue and it can potentially cause some very dangerous consequences. So before we get into the details of antibiotic resistance, we're actually going to go over a few things about antibiotics themselves. So the first thing to mention with regard to antibiotics is what exactly was the very first major antibiotic? And that was penicillin. And penicillin, the story of its discovery, is one of my favorite stories in biology because what happened was it was actually discovered by accident by Alexander Fleming. So Alexander Fleming, what he was doing was studying Staph aureus, which is one of the bacteria that we work with in the lab for this class. And what happened was he comes back after one weekend and he looks at his plate his agar plate, just like we use in lab, and he notices instead of having the Staph aureus bacteria growing all over the plate, which are these speckles here, there's this big splotch of contamination, of fluffy flower-like contamination. And as you know by now, that means a fungus is growing there. Now, normally when we come back to an experiment and we find fluffy fungal contamination, what's the first instinct to do? Throw out that plate and start again, because normally that would ruin your experiment. Well, thankfully, Alexander Fleming didn't do that. He didn't throw out the plate because what do you notice when you look at this plate? There's the fluffy fungus, and there's this big zone of empty space where the bacteria was killed off near the fungus. And then the bacteria grows once it's further away from the fungus. So thankfully, instead of throwing out this plate, Alexander Fleming asked himself, well, what's going on here? Maybe there's something quite valuable that we're not aware of. And so when he observed this zone of inhibition where the fungus was, he decided to look into it more. Now, him finding this, you know, odd little contamination and the after effects of it, the way he handled it actually maps out the scientific method quite well. And the scientific method is one of the core concepts that you have to learn in this course. So when you think of the scientific method, the first thing you want to do is have observation and defining a problem. In this case, the observation that Alexander Fleming made was if you again look at this figure, no bacteria could grow anywhere near the fungus. Once this observation was made and the problem was defined that bacteria could not grow near the fungi, Alexander Fleming was then able to formulate a hypothesis. And that hypothesis is that fungi can synthesize chemicals that inhibit bacterial growth. So now once you make this hypothesis, you then have to test it somehow. You test it with experiments. And in order to test it with experiments, yet you have to use an experimental group and a control group. You always want an experimental group and a control group. Now, if you're testing the hypothesis that fungi are going to cause these chemicals that inhibit bacterial growth, then your experimental group should be bacteria in media that had fungi that supposedly would have secreted these chemicals to kill the bacteria. Your control group to then compare it to is a sample where nothing has been done, where no fungi has ever been present. So in the control group, you would grow bacteria in media that's sterile, meaning never had any contamination, no fungi. You then collect and record data, and you see experimental group, there should be no bacterial growth. The fungi should have killed off the bacteria. Whereas in the control group, there's no fungi present, so the bacteria should grow just perfectly normal. 
perfectly fine. Once you have this data, you then want to analyze it and interpret what it actually means. And that's when you draw your conclusions from it. So the conclusions would be that the fungi were indeed secreting some sort of chemicals that were inhibiting the bacteria or killing them off, and that the hypothesis was likely correct. What would you then have to do after all of that? You have to repeat this experiment. You have to make sure that you get these same results multiple times. Once you do that, the most important step is actually right down here at the bottom, which is communicate results meaning you have to report your results or your theories, usually in the form of peer-reviewed scientific journal articles, which you'll use a lot in the lab setting. Now, this step is the most important because in science, basically, everything we do doesn't matter if we've never reported it, if other scientists can't find it and can't utilize that information. Okay, so building the scientific knowledge pyramid is so crucial across the world. Now there's one other thing I want to point out before I summarize all of this information, and that is when you look at this figure over here of the scientific method, you'll notice that before the hypothesis stage, it has the term research. That term research does not mean that you're doing experiments before the hypothesis. That term research means once you think you have an idea of what might be incurring, what you're observing, you want to do research, meaning look up other journal articles, look up other scientific publications, and find background information on this concept to then build your hypothesis. And that's why a hypothesis, you've probably heard it called something else before, which is an educated guess. And the reason that it's called educated guess is that you should have done some research before you built that hypothesis. Okay, so please make sure that you're very comfortable with all of the steps of the scientific method. Since it was a lot of information, I've now summarized them on the next slide for you to be able to jot down notes on all of this. So as I just mentioned, here are the notes that you can jot down. You can simply pause the video and make sure to gather all of this information in your notes. Because like I said, understanding the scientific method and how it's actually utilized, especially with this example of penicillin, is one of the core goals of this course. So please make sure that you write down this information very carefully. Now, moving on to the concept of antibiotics in general, as you kind of saw from that first introduction of antibiotics, antibiotics are not something that we're making from scratch in a lab. Antibiotics are naturally natural parts of bacteria or fungi. Now, you may ask yourself, well, if I'm a bacteria, why am I going to create something that kills bacteria? Wouldn't that kind of be a problem for me? Well, think about it. If you're a bacteria and you're in one location, you don't want any competition there, right? You want all of the resources and nutrients so that you can grow and flourish. So the idea of producing antibiotics is basically self-preservation or self-protection. If a bacteria can produce antibiotics to kill off other bacteria, it can keep itself safe and get all the nutrients and resources. Now, like I just said, if you're a bacteria producing something that can kill bacteria, which you are, you have to have some form of control for it. So a lot of bacteria, they'll have various mechanisms to resist the antibiotics that they're producing. One example of this is sometimes they'll keep the antibiotic in an inactive form and then once they secrete it, it becomes activated so that it can kill nearby bacteria without the current bacteria who's producing it worrying about that dangerous chemical. 
Now, when we talk about antibiotics and drugs in general, it's very important to know the terminology. Uh, these are terms that you will encounter a lot, whether you go into the medical field or throughout your own life since, I hate to break it to you, but odds are you're gonna have an infection at one point or another. So two big categories when we talk about antibiotics are broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum. Okay, so you have to ask yourself, how do these two differ? Broad spectrum is just like it sounds. It covers a very broad spectrum of bacteria or microbes. So broad spectrum antibiotics will kill a variety of different bacteria. So the way I kind of visualize it is, picture an antibiotic capable of killing both gram positives and gram negatives. Whereas what would a narrow spectrum antibiotic do? Only kill one type. It's much more specific. So in that example, a narrow spectrum antibiotic instead might just kill gram positives only. The other terminology that you'll see a lot when we talk about antibiotics and drugs is cytal versus static. Okay, specifically these terms over here, bacteriostatic and bacteriocidal. Okay. Whenever you hear the word cidal, suicidal, homicidal, genocidal, any of that means killing. So bacteriocidal are antibiotics or drugs or chemicals that will kill bacteria. Okay, so anything killing bacteria is bacteriocidal, even certain temperatures. So when we talk about temperatures, very high temperatures are bacteriocidal. They kill bacteria. Whereas bacteria static in biology, if something is static or in stasis, that means it's staying still. It's not growing, it's not active. So bacteria static simply inhibit slowing or stopping the growth of the bacteria without actually killing it. Now keep in mind, bacteria static, an example of that is cold temperatures. So for instance, when you put food in the fridge or the freezer, you're not killing the bacteria on there. Instead, you're just slowing their growth a whole lot, okay? Kind of like if you've ever seen a little fly get stuck in a refrigerator and it really goes very slowly because the cold temperatures are slowing down its metabolic activity. And the same thing happens with bacteria. Okay, so make sure you're very comfortable with knowing the definitions of each of these terms and how they differ from each other. So again, broad spectrum kills or targets a whole bunch of bacteria. Narrow spectrum is specific to one or very few types. Cytal means killing, static means simply inhibiting, slowing or stopping growth, but not killing. Now, the big term for today's lesson and throughout the course of microbiology is selective toxicity. It is a fundamental criteria for picking any kind of medical antibiotic or drug that you are going to use. I want you to circle, star, highlight a million times the term selective toxicity and make sure you know its definition. The definition is Selective toxicity means you should destroy the pathogen with little or no harm to the host. Okay, so destroy the pathogen with little or no harm to the host. Okay, so anytime we talk about selective toxicity, things that are the most selectively toxic will be the best at hurting the pathogen without hurting the human or the host. Whereas the least selectively toxic targets will end up hurting both the pathogen and the host. So you don't want anything that's least selectively toxic. You want your drugs or antibiotics to be very selective for only hurting the bacteria, selecting the bacteria and not the host. When we talk about that, there is one structure you have to remember, 
and that is the cell wall. The cell wall out of all of the groups listed on this slide or all the groups you can think of in terms of targeting to kill or hurt bacteria, the cell wall is the most selectively toxic. Okay, the most selectively toxic target is the cell wall. And that's because as we mentioned previously, bacterial cells have a cell wall, whereas human cells do not. So you can pump a chemical or drug into the human body that destroys cell walls. And since their own cells do not have this, it's not going to hurt their own cells. The least, least selective toxic a selectively toxic target is the plasma membrane. Okay, so that is the worst one to target because our plasma membrane is identical to bacteria's plasma membrane. So when you target the plasma membrane, you're also going to hurt the human. Okay, so make sure you write most selectively toxic next to the cell wall and least selectively toxic, bad to target next to the plasma membrane. Some antibiotics and drugs will also target some other things such as protein synthesis, nucleic acids, or the metabolism of the bacteria. But again, the best one to target is always the cell wall if possible. This slide is just to give you some examples of various uh, common anti microbials or antibiotics that you'll encounter when you're in the medical field or again if you yourself ever end up in any kind of situation with infections and it shows for each of those common agents what is targeted and you'll notice that these three including the very first famous penicillins they target the cell wall whereas these guys here such as tetracyclines Instead, they target the ribosomes, which is protein synthesis. Rifamycins and quinolones. I want you to put a star next to rifamycins and quinolones and make note that those target nucleic acids, such as RNA and DNA. Now, when targeting nucleic acids, again, these structures and their enzymes are so similar to humans that these guys are also going to cause some problems for the patient as well. So whenever you're dealing with any rifamycins or quinolones, you're going to see a huge list of side effects. Okay, so they are still used because they're possible to target, but they're usually a later resource if initial antibiotics did not work or if your patient or you are suffering from a really intense infection. Okay. The other one listed here is sulfonamides, and we'll talk about folate or folic acid metabolism in a minute. Now, as I already mentioned, the cell wall is your number one best target. It is the most easily selectively toxic target because, like we said, bacteria have it, but we do not. So you can destroy the cell walls all you want without destroying the human cells because the human cells do not have the cell walls. The two examples to remember, and please do remember that they are examples of cell wall targeting, are penicillin and cephalosporins. Okay, penicillin and cephalosporins, and what they do is they block the enzymes that build peptidoglycan, specifically the ones that will make that matrix, that cross-linking of sugars, that we mentioned previously, the NAG-NAM sugars, okay? The way they do this is if you look at their chemical structure, they have what's called a beta-lactam ring, okay? Beta-lactam ring. I want you to circle the word beta-lactam ring because that will be important when we talk about resistance, okay? So basically what they do is they use that ring to then bind to the enzymes that would build peptidoglycan so that those enzymes can't work anymore. No peptidoglycan, no cell wall. Now, very important question I wrote over here, for which bacterial infection won't it work to target the cell wall? Well, which bacteria do you know of that does not have 
a cell wall to target? That would be mycoplasma, if you remember mycoplasma. And so the infection that this wouldn't work for is walking pneumonia, which we said is caused by mycoplasma. Okay, so make sure to write both down as the answer. So it will not work for walking pneumonia caused by mycoplasma. Now, the next structure that you might want to target would be plasma membrane, but remember we said, do not target this. The plasma membrane is the least selectively toxic target. Okay, so this one is not so great to choose. Why? Because our plasma membrane is the same as bacteria. So if you put something in the human body that is destroying bacteria plasma membranes, it will also destroy the human plasma membranes. So it'll destroy your own cells, which you do not want to do. The next option would be to target protein synthesis. Now you may be saying to yourself, well, I'm pretty sure my, my cells have to produce proteins too, and they both have to use ribosomes, right? Well, lucky for us, the bacterial ribosomes are slightly different in structure from ours. So if you look at this little figure I made, it's basically fancy scientific ways of showing that the prokaryote or bacterial ribosome is a slightly different size and shape and made of slightly different components than the eukaryotic one, okay? So you don't have to worry about the exact numbers or the components, just realize that bacterial ribosomes are slightly different from eukaryotic ribosomes, which allows us to target them if we want. But again, it won't be as good as targeting the cell wall because, you know, cell wall we don't have at all. The next option is to target nucleic acids. And like I said a few slides ago, I want you to put stars next to quinolones and rifamycin. And make sure you know anytime you hear those words or you see them in writing, right away think to yourself, these target nucleic acids. So either DNA or RNA. Now, instead of targeting the exact structures of DNA or RNA, since ours are identical, made up of the same A's and G's and C's, instead, these guys target enzymes and evolved in the process. But now, since I've already said that, you know, we both have DNA, RNA, and similar kinds of structures and all, you will see a lot of side effects with these. So targeting nucleic acids is a problem because nucleic acids we have similarities with. So humans and bacteria have similarities. Now the reason why I want you to star and remember quinolones and rifamycins targeting DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, enzymes such as topoisomerases or um, bacterial RNA polymerase is because the side effects will be so problematic. So, so the example I always use is uh, about a year or two ago, my grandmother had a really bad infection and the first round of antibiotics didn't work. So my grandfather called me after he had picked up his, her, the, the new antibiotics for her and he was very concerned and worried because he said to me, wow, there's a really long list of side effects with this booklet, with this prescription. He said, it's like having a book attached to it with so many side effects. And I asked him, I said right away, does it say quinolones or rifamycins anywhere? And he goes, yeah, it says rifamycins on it. I knew right away, just from hearing the fact that there's a long list of side effects, I knew exactly what they were giving and why. So the fact that the first round of antibiotics didn't work, they then had to switch to a stronger, but possibly more problematic antibiotic, which would be the rifamycins. But again, keep in mind, both of these quinolones, rifamycins are targeting nucleic acids, so they will have a ton of side effects. The last thing you might want to target is metabolism. And when we think about metabolism, we say all of the chemical reactions 
in a body or cell. So when we say targeting metabolism, you're using a drug or antibiotic to destroy one of the pathways, the, the, the chemical reactions within a bacteria. So something that it would try to build, you are blocking it from building or producing. So the one that we tend to target is the folic acid pathway. So circle the term folic acid. Folic acid, I'm sure everyone here has probably heard of because you hear it with humans as well. So the folic acid pathway is necessary in order to build or make nucleic acids. So folic acid is needed to make nucleic acids. So it's very important for bacterial cells and also our cells. Now, I just said that we need folic acid. So how is it that we can target the folic acid pathway and block production, but not hurt our patient? Well, where else can that patient get folic acid? Does the patient have to eat? Sorry, does the patient have to build folic acid? No, the patient can eat it, right? We can get it from our diet. We can get it from even pills. Think of if someone's pregnant, what do they do? They take prenatal vitamins that have a ton of folic acid in them. So yes, you can block the synthesis of folic acid and have your patient be okay because the patient can still get folic acid from taking it in, eating it, or vitamins, okay? Whereas the bacteria, you're not gonna see them eating a nice leafy salad and getting folic acid. Okay, so when you think of our diet getting folic acid, some of the big places you get it are leafy veggies, citrus, beans, and rice. But like I said, also a lot of um, supplements like prenatal vitamins as well. Okay, so whenever you hear targeting metabolism, think folic acid pathway and make sure you know why that's okay to target since we need folic acid as well. Now, so far we've been focusing on antibiotics and trying to destroy bacteria. But if you think about it, not every infection is going to be bacteria. There are plenty of other infections as well, such as viral infections. And as you know, you can't give a patient an antibiotic for a viral infection. Now, viral infections are much more difficult to treat than bacterial infections. In fact, when we talk about any of the infections, I want you to know that viruses are going to be the most difficult to treat. We'll kind of put them in a certain order in a little bit, but for now think viruses, most difficult infections to treat, okay? The reason that is, is that they are intracellular parasites. So if you look at that word and ask yourself what it means, when you hear something is intra, that means it's within. So this is saying intracellular, so it's within your cells. That means that these parasites go inside your own cells. They integrate a lot of times with your own DNA. And so trying to target them with a drug is going to be quite harmful to the patient as well because of how integrated they've now become how embedded within your own cells they've become, okay? So most drugs are going to be toxic to the host, but you still have to try because of the damage that the virus is doing. So you hope that the drugs that you give will be less toxic than the virus itself, okay? But it will, any of the antivirals will have quite a few side effects and be rather dangerous for the, the host. Okay. Now, with viruses, there are a few things that we target with antivirals. Okay. If you think of them, when you think of viruses, they're basically just a protein shell around a nucleic acid. Okay. They're not as um, robust or, or filled with items as bacterial cells or our cells. A virus is just two things. It's the protein shell with a nucleic acid inside, either DNA or RNA. So when we go to target them, there's a few things that they tend to target. One is the assembly and release 
of these viruses. Okay, so that means any of the pathways that the viruses use to build that protein shell and put together new viruses. Notice when we talk about viruses, we'll always say assembly because they do not reproduce, they don't have sex, they don't divide, they assemble. Basically what they do is they make more nucleic acid, more protein shells, and they put them together. So what we do is we try to block those pathways. Another thing we try to block are the viral DNA polymerases that are responsible for replicating their genome. Because like I said, if they're just a genome, a nucleic acid, and a protein shell, then you want to stop them from being able to make more of themselves. The last thing that we tend to try and target is viral encoding or entry pathways. And again, this will make more sense when you really get into more detail of viruses, but basically this is trying to target things like receptors on your own cells that they may use to try and enter your cells. But again, no matter what you're targeting when it comes to antivirals, they're gonna tend to be kind of nasty for your patient and have a lot of side effects. Because again, viruses are the most difficult to treat as they are intracellular parasites. Now, in addition to viral infections, sometimes you or your patient will have fungal infections, okay? Now, the good thing about fungi is that they do have a cell wall. And anytime you hear cell walls, what do you think of? Very selectively toxic. So now when it comes to targeting the cell wall, antifungals, they're gonna be easier than viruses, right? Because cell walls are very selectively toxic, but fungi are more difficult to treat than bacteria because their cell wall is actually stronger, stronger than bacterial cell walls because they have what's called sterols, like ergosterol within their cell wall, which is basically a more robust carbohydrate than you would find in the bacterial cell walls. Okay, so like I said, when you start to think about putting in order which infections are the easiest to treat, which are the hardest to treat in terms of targeting with drugs, the easiest will be bacteria, then fungi, because they also have a cell wall, but it's a thicker, tougher one, and then the most difficult will be the viruses, okay? Now with fungi, sometimes they also try to target nucleic acid synthesis, but again, why do they not really want to do that often? Well, anything to do with nucleic acids, kind of know that's hitting a bit close to home, meaning the human, your patient, you, whoever's getting treated also has nucleic acids. So it's riskier, going to have a little more side effects. Okay, so when you can target a cell wall, go for it. The last category of drugs to mention are the antiparasitics. Now, the antiparasitics are similar to the idea of viruses in that it's kind of difficult to find truly effective therapies for these guys because again, they tend to be intracellular parasites. Now, they are a little easier than viruses to target because of some differences that they have from us and the fact that they do not integrate into our DNA. So viruses tend to integrate into our DNA and really embed within the cells, whereas parasites do not tend to become one with our DNA. Now, since they are difficult and they're intracellular, they will have a lot of really severe side effects like antivirals will but there are some options for targeting when it comes to parasites. We tend to target asexual reproduction and folic acid metabolism. So asexual reproduction is very selectively toxic because think about it, do humans reproduce asexually? No, they reproduce sexually. So targeting asexual reproduction shouldn't hurt your host as much. The other thing to target, like we've mentioned before, is the folic acid metabolism. Now, anytime you hear folic acid, remember there are a few things I want you to remember. 
First off, folic acid is used for making nucleic acids. It is needed by bacteria and humans, but the difference between us is humans can obtain folic acid from their diet. So it's okay for you to try and target the pathway that produces it, okay? Because we can still get it anyway. So now looking at this slide, I just wanna kind of fill in the last piece of what we've been organizing so far. When we put infections in order in terms of difficulty to treat or find therapies for, the hardest to treat will be viral infections. The second most difficult will be antiparasitics. Next is antifungals. And then the easiest is bacterial. Okay, so the order is viral, parasitic, fungal, bacteria, from hardest to treat to easiest to target. Okay, so now that you have kind of become kind of comfortable with regard to antibiotics and drugs targeting infections, now we get to the big topic, the antibiotic resistance, which you hear all over the news. And if you're in the hospitals, you hear it within there as well, because it's becoming a true worldwide crisis. Now, the big fact that I want you to remember when it comes to antibiotic resistance, the thing that is causing this resistance problem is killing off normal flora. Okay, that's going to be the constant message that you get throughout all of these slides, okay? That killing off normal flora is allowing the resistant bacteria to then flourish, take over, and become a problem, okay? As you know, normal flora are supposed to be your good, healthy bacteria keeping the bad guys from taking over. So if you kill them with antibiotics, then that's going to be a problem. So now we're going to go into more information about antibiotic resistance. Okay, so now as we continue to think about that concept of antibiotic resistance, there are a few questions that I want you to think about. The first one is something that we already touched upon, which is why would bacteria naturally have resistance to antibiotics? And the reason that they naturally have to have resistance is because they naturally produce antibiotics. So if they didn't have resistance, then they wouldn't be able to survive the antibiotics that they produce that they want to use to kill other bacteria who are their competitors. Now the next question is very important because this is the big deal that you constantly see on the news and the controversy in terms of antibiotic use. So why exactly does increased exposure to antibiotics increase antibiotic resistance? Now, the term I want you to remember here is evolutionary pressure. If you are increasing the exposure to antibiotics, you're increasing the evolutionary pressure towards antibiotic resistance. So what that means is, Antibiotic resistance, for a bacteria to have that, is only an advantage if the antibiotic is present, right? If the antibiotic is not present, then there's nothing that bacteria would ever notice. So what this means is the more antibiotic present, meaning the more antibiotics that you pump into the incorrect people, the more advantage the resistant bacteria will have because like I said, what you're doing is you're killing off all the normal flora, which means you're leaving space and resources and nutrients for the resistant problematic pathogens to now replicate and replicate and replicate and to really flourish, okay? So what this means is you're creating evolutionary pressure because only the most fit resistant bacteria will survive the antibiotics that you're giving and they'll then pass on the resistance whereas all the other ones that are not resistant they die off so they don't get to pass on that resistance to offspring 
Now, I want you to put stars next to that explanation because this concept of how exactly antibiotic resistance is coming about is really important because so many people have misconceptions about what is actually causing the antibiotic resistance. For instance, many people mistakenly believe that when you give an antibiotic to someone, you're then mutating the bacteria so they're resistant and you're making them stronger. You are not doing that, okay? The bacteria themselves are not changing. They already have the antibiotic resistance. And so when you give that person antibiotics, only those resistant ones will survive, replicate, and pass on the resistance to more and more offspring. Okay, so please keep in mind when you write down your explanation for the second question, that concept of increased exposure, make a note that the bacteria is not getting mutated, the bacteria is not getting changed by the antibiotic you are giving. They already have the genes for this resistance. Now, the last thing that you see on this slide is the question, what is the biggest contributing factor to antibiotic resistance? And this is critical for all of you going into the medical field, okay? The answer to that question is in big, bold, red letters on the very next slide. So here it is, the biggest factor that's contributing to antibiotic resistance is the inappropriate clinical use of antibiotics. So you have to ask yourself, what exactly do we mean by this? What is the inappropriate clinical use of antibiotics? Well, that's a fancy way of saying misuse of antibiotics. And there are a lot of examples of this that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, either in your clinical experiences or your own personal experiences as people who have, again, at one point or another, dealt with antibiotics or taking medicine. The number one example of this is prescribing or taking antibiotics for a virus. Because what will the antibiotics do for the virus? Absolutely nothing. Instead, what will the antibiotics be doing in that person? Not harming or killing the virus. Instead, the antibiotics will be killing their normal flora. And as you kill the normal flora, what happens? The ones that are resistant will flourish, take over, replicate, and pass on the resistance to their offspring. The second big example of inappropriate clinical use of antibiotics is how many people do you know? As soon as they start feeling even the slightest bit better, what do they do? They stop taking their antibiotics before finishing the full course. This is a big problem. You don't want to do that. You want to completely finish the antibiotics and make sure that the infection is fully killed off. Otherwise, you are just lowering the amount of normal flora while allowing the pathogens to kick back up into bigger numbers, okay? And as you understand more and more about infection cycles, you'll see that yes, you will start feeling a little better while you still have plenty of that bacteria still in your body, okay? So never stop taking antibiotics early finish the full course. And the third thing never, ever, ever do is never use prescriptions that were prescribed for someone else or even for yourself, but back in the day, let's say for an old infection you had. Okay, because how many times do you see someone, let's say, you'll get some dental work done, they have some antibiotics, they didn't fully use them because they broke our inappropriate clinical use bullet point number two we were just talking about. And then what do they do? Oh, year or two later, oh, I'm not feeling so well. Oh, I think I might have an infection. Oh, let me grab those old antibiotics from my cabinet. What did they not do? They did not get cultured to figure out what exactly they have. Do they even have a bacterial infection that those antibiotics will do something for? Well, it's 
not a full course of antibiotics, so it's not going to do what it's supposed to anyway. And odds are, how many times is it just a viral infection? So since they didn't go to a doctor and get a new prescription, they're now taking old pills that probably won't even work for what they have. Okay, and again, what are those old pills doing? Killing off the normal flora and allowing the resistant pathogens to flourish, replicate. The last point that I want to make is that hospitals and healthcare facilities are ideal for the development and spread of antibiotic resistance because what do they do? They are constantly pumping antibiotics into all patients and many times they have not cultured to see if they're using the proper treatment for the proper infection. And again, how many of those patients actually just have viral issues, okay? So when they're doing things that they consider preventative or protecting the patient, in the long run, sometimes they're actually hurting that patient, okay? So yes, antibiotics are a very good thing when you have an infection that actually requires them, okay? So please don't take this lesson and say, oh no, antibiotics are bad, I'm never gonna take them, you shouldn't be giving them out either. No, antibiotics are very, very good. If you have a bacterial infection for which you have been cultured for and we know exactly what to target with which antibiotic, okay? What we're saying is the misuse or improper use of antibiotics is what's the problem here, okay? Now to recap the different misuses that I've mentioned so that you can jot them down and further explain them in your notes. The first one we said, prescribing or taking for a virus, okay? And make sure you understand why that's such a problem. What will that do? The second one is, like we said, people tend to stop taking antibiotics early as soon as they think that they're feeling a little bit better. Third one, people use what was prescribed for someone else or even for themselves, but back in the day, old prescriptions for themselves. And the last one that we mentioned is hospital and healthcare facilities overuse and don't always culture. So they're the perfect breeding ground for antibiotic resistance. Now, antibiotic resistance can very quickly develop. So we have a series of steps here that can help increase the useful lifespan of drugs and that should be considered when you're in the medical field or even when you yourself are dealing with infections, just to kind of try and minimize the resistance that you end up with. The first way to increase the useful lifespan of antibiotics or drugs is exactly the opposite of everything we mentioned on the previous slide. Instead of doing any of those bad things, do the opposite, do the right thing. Perform the optimal use of antibiotics. And what do we mean by that? Never take antibiotics or never give antibiotics for a viral infection. Always use the full course, never stopping early. Never, ever, ever take anything that was prescribed for anyone else. Honestly, that should just be common sense. That shouldn't be something that we say in a course. It should be common sense that you never take a medication that, pres that was prescribed to someone else, and you shouldn't be using your old medications either from previous infections. Now, the next one here, calls back to information we mentioned a few slides back. In order to increase the useful lifespan of antibiotics, one thing we can do is control the use of certain classes of drugs. Okay, so controlling certain classes, such as having the selective use of broad spectrum antibiotics, that's valuable because with the broad spectrum antibiotics, if you think about it, what are they doing? They're killing even more variety of the normal flora, okay? So they're allowing for even more space and resources for the bad guys to then flourish, okay? So you kind of want to limit the use of the really powerful, very broad um, drugs so that you kind of 
avoid that issue. Okay, you want as few normal flora to be killed as possible. The third one is something that I'm sure everyone here has been, you know, has dealt with at some point or another, and that's the rotation or cyclic pattern of antibiotic use. So for instance, if you've ever gone in to the doctor's office and let's say you have an ear infection, what are they going to ask you before they actually prescribe you antibiotics? Have you been on antibiotics recently? And they'll check your medical record and they'll look to see when you most recently had antibiotics and which one you were given. And they'll try and avoid giving you the same antibiotic, especially if it's been within a year or two. Okay, they want to change up which normal flora is getting depleted so that they have a chance to restore themselves over time. You don't want to keep knocking down those same normal flora. The next one's a little counterintuitive, be, you know, compared to something that we just said a minute ago. One of the things they do to increase the useful lifespan of drugs or antibiotics is combination therapy. And what that means is they may give a patient a cocktail of different antibiotics. Now, I know that kind of makes you think, well, I thought we were supposed to be limiting the amount of antibiotics. But in some cases, if someone has a severe enough infection or things like sepsis, you want to try giving them as many different antibiotics as possible because now your goal is to destroy as many of the pathogens and kind of get rid of any possible resistant ones that would flourish. So for instance, if let's say you applied five different antibiotics in a cocktail, well, yes, there may be some potential pathogens that can resist antibiotic A, and they would have flourished. But that's why you're giving them antibiotic B, because that'll then destroy them. And yes, there may be some that would have been resistant to antibiotic B, but that's why you're giving C, okay? So by giving multiple, it reduces the chances that there will be any bacteria that is resistant to all of those. So none of the bacteria should get a chance to flourish, okay? The last one I call an unfortunate dream, which is number five, the evaluation of roots of resistance and implementation of global change. I call this one a dream because if you think about the current state of, you know, America, the world even, and their view of science and scientists, the ideal would be that the public would listen to what we're saying, accept our data, accept our proof, and make these changes, make true implementations and policies to prevent the spread of antibiotic resistance. The reason I call this a dream is think about how the public view scientists. Unfortunately, they view us as the bad guys. They think that we're all lying to them, that we're doing horrible things, we must be poisoning them, we must be withholding you know, magical cures to this, that, the other thing. And they don't trust anything we say. Okay, so unfortunately, scientists have been made to be the bad guys instead of being, you know, valued or appreciated or respected for trying to help. So the idea of global change is kind of a dream because you odds are would never see them able to implement new policies and really trust the word of the scientists and the medical field to make things better. Okay, but that's why I value this lesson so much every semester, because I hope that by teaching all of you this information as you go out into the medical field or as you deal with your own infections and the infections of your loved ones, you will now make the smart choices and you will one by one help reduce antibiotic resistance. Now we keep saying the term antibiotic resistance and we haven't really gone into the details of what exactly that means. What mechanisms are these bacteria using in order to fight the antibiotics? Okay, There are five main ways that bacteria will resist the antibiotics. The first one you see here is by blocking the drug's entry into the bacteria. 
Okay, so if the antibiotic cannot get into the bacteria, it can't kill it, right? The second one is inactivation of the antibiotic. So in this case, the antibiotic makes it into the bacterial cell, but the bacteria will then break or destroy the antibiotic. The third one is my personal favorite, and it's efflux pumping of the antibiotic. What this means is that as you pump the antibiotic into the bacteria, they then keep throwing it right back out of their cell, okay? Pumping it out so that they never have a toxic level of the antibiotic within them. The next one is the modification of the antibiotic target. And what that means is in some bacteria, whatever structure would have been targeted by a particular antibiotic happens to be slightly a different shape. Okay, so now that antibiotic is unable to bind to that target in that particular bacteria. And if the antibiotic can't bind, it can't do its job at destroying the bacteria. So the bacteria is now safe. The last one is alteration of a metabolic pathway. And whenever we say metabolic pathway, which one do you wanna write down? Folic acid pathway, okay? The folic acid pathway is the big one. So in this case, if the bacteria can find an alternate route of getting folic acid or whatever the metabolic pathway is, they can survive, okay? What I want you to do is next to the second bullet point here, inactivation of the drug, I want you to write penicillin, okay, which is the famous one that we know, as well as cephalosporins, which you'll see the spelling in a few slides. For efflux pumping, I want you to think of tetracycline, okay? Now we're gonna go over each of the mechanisms of resistance in more detail now, and that way you can really get a visualization of what's occurring. We're going to skip the blocking of the drug's entry and head right into inactivation of the antibiotic. But before we do that, I just want to once again point out that with any of these mechanisms, the goal of the bacteria is to survive the antibiotic, to not get killed off. So the first mechanism of resistance I want you to know is the inactivation of the antibiotic. So in this case, the antibiotic will enter the bacterial cell, but what the bacteria will do, it will have some sort of enzyme that can then break that antibiotic. Picture it cutting it up or cutting the main part of it. So that antibiotic cannot occur, cannot do its job, okay? The big example of that is penicillin, okay, which you've seen in labs, in, in microbiology lab class, okay? With that, with that inactivation of that particular antibiotic of penicillin and cephalosporins as well, you have the idea of the enzyme being beta-lactamase, and the beta-lactamase will cut the beta-lactam ring of penicillin, or the penicillin family of drugs, and if that is cut, then the penicillin can no longer bind to the bacterial enzymes that form peptidoglycan. And so their cell wall is safe, okay? In addition to penicillin, this also works for ampicillin as well, which is the one that you've seen in lab classes. Okay. You'll see this in more detail in a few slides where you'll be able to see penicillin and cephalosporin specifically. The next example is the one that I said is my favorite, and for this one, I want you to think of tetracycline. Efflux pumping simply means that the bacteria is actively pumping out the antibiotic. So every time that antibiotic enters the bacteria, the bacteria will have porin channels, okay, protein channels on their outer cell membrane or cell wall. And what they will do is every time the antibiotic enters the cell, they'll then push it through the porins to exit the cell. 
So they're always keeping the antibiotic levels in that cell at a very, very low, minimal level that is not toxic to them. The next example is modification of an antibiotic target. And for this one, this is the example I gave in terms of if the target in that cell happens to be a different shape, okay, or let's say missing a particular receptor, the antibiotic is unable to recognize and bind to it, which means the antibiotic can't do its job of killing the bacteria. That bacteria will survive. The big example of this is a lot of times you'll encounter bacterial cells with a slightly different shape to their ribosomes. So if the antibiotic is meant to bind to the ribosome, but that ribosome is the wrong shape now, the antibiotic can't do its job and that bacteria will survive. And notice how I say in the slide, you'll see the bullet point mutate gene that codes for target protein. What this means is that bacteria will already have a mutated gene from its past through evolution, and that will code for the different target protein. Okay. Now, with that, it's not the drug itself doing these things. Okay. The drug is not changing the proteins or the ribosome in that cell, keep in mind, it's just that the bacteria already happen to have a different shape, a mutated protein, and that was a benefit when the antibiotic then encountered that cell. The last mechanism for the resistance of antibiotics is alteration of a metabolic pathway. And like I said, for this one, always think of folic acid synthesis. Now, when we talk about folic acid, the first thing you should always ask yourself is what exactly is folic acid used for? Now, remember, we said folic acid is used to make nucleic acids, such as DNA and RNA. And that is critical to bacterial and human cells. So think about it. If you have an antibiotic that is trying to kill a bacteria by destroying its ability to produce or make folic acid, then how can that bacteria overcome that and survive this attack? Well, what the bacteria can do is have an alternate pathway. If it has some other way to obtain folic acid, then it doesn't matter if that antibiotic tries to destroy its regular pathway. It still has folic acid, so it will survive. The example that I usually use for this is some bacteria happen to be what I call human-like. Some bacteria have the ability that we have, which is to uptake take in folic acid from their environment, from the media they're in, and use that rather than having to make it, okay? So you'll try and kill that bacteria by destroying its ability to produce folic acid, but the bacteria won't care because it has the ability to just grab more folic acid from around it, from its own environment, the way we do, like when we eat leafy greens or take prenatal vitamins. Now, the last thing I want to do over here is to give you some specific examples of antibiotic resistance. And for each of these examples, the first thing that you have to do is think about how that antibiotic would try to kill the bacteria, and then think of how that bacteria would fight back. Now, before we go into each of those details, I want to mention one more thing, and that is how exactly do bacteria have these resistant mechanisms. You know, for instance, how is it they have that enzyme beta-lactamase or any enzyme that can break down antibiotics? Well, what they have are plasmids. We call them antibiotic resistance plasmids or R plasmids. And what plasmids are are simply extra rings of DNA, meaning extra genes, that certain bacteria can have and that they can then transfer to other bacteria as well through conjugation or bacterial sex. So now if a bacteria happens to have the plasmid 
that codes for producing beta lactamase. Well, that bacteria is going to be very lucky and at an advantage if it enter, ever encounters penicillin or cephalosporins. Okay. Now, speaking of that, we head into our specific examples. The first specific example that you should know for antibiotic resistance is how bacteria can resist penicillin and cephalosporins. Now, like I said, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, how would that antibiotic normally kill a bacteria? So the way penicillin and cephalosporins work is, remember, they have that beta-lactam ring, which will then bind to the enzymes that would normally build peptidoglycan in bacteria. So they block the NAGNAM formation, or they block peptidoglycan formation, so now that bacteria can't make its cell wall. Boom, that bacteria is dead. Okay, and again, this is a reminder of what that beta-lactam ring looks like. So how would a bacteria resist this antibiotic? Well, what if it has the plasmid, like I just said, that can code for beta-lactamase, meaning what if it has the gene that ultimately makes the enzyme that cuts this ring open? And when this ring is open, cut open, that can no longer bind to the bacteria's enzymes and it can no longer kill the bacteria. Now keep in mind, which bacterial infection won't penicillin work for and won't this resistance matter about? Well, remember we said mycoplasma, okay? Mycoplasma or walking pneumonia, none of this slide matters for. Okay, and keep in mind that I always say which bacterial infection won't it work for to target the cell wall. So never say, oh yeah, penicillin won't work for a cold. No, that's a viral infection. Okay, so I'm asking for which bacterial infection won't penicillin and cephalosporins work? And the answer is mycoplasma walking pneumonia. And we already explained that bullet point of how exactly beta-lactamase is working. Keep in mind, it's inactivating. It is cutting that antibiotic. The next resistance that you have to know is how bacteria resist chloramphenicol. But like I said, the first thing you always want to ask yourself is, how would this antibiotic try to kill the bacteria? And the way chloramphenicol works is it's an antibiotic that inhibits protein synthesis. So what it does is it will bind to that rRNA of the ribosome and block the reaction of building the protein. Now the way it does that is through this OH right here. So this whole structure is chloramphenicol and it has this OH here that allows it to bind to the ribosome and block the bacteria's protein synthesis. So how would a bacteria fight back? Well, change this, block this OH so that it cannot bind to the ribosome. Okay, so what some bacteria are lucky enough to have is an enzyme that allows it to inactivate the addition of acetyl groups to that OH, okay? Fancy way of saying, some bacteria will have an enzyme that makes the OH into this structure, okay, or even changes this OH to this structure, so that now these versions of chloramphenicol do not have an OH to bind to the ribosome. Okay, so if I ever asked you about how a bacteria would be resistant to chloramphenicol, that bacteria can have an enzyme that modifies the OH, blocks the OH with an acetyl group, okay? So it's capping that OH with an acetyl group so that antibiotic can no longer bind to the ribosome, okay? The specific name of that enzyme is chloramphenicol acetyltransferase, or CAT for short. You don't have to memorize that name. Just know that to resist chloramphenicol, a bacteria can have an enzyme to cap that OH with an acetyl group. 
The next category of resistance is very, very similar to quorum phenicol, and this is the resistance to amino glycosides. Now again, the first thing you have to ask yourself, how would this antibiotic kill bacteria? Well, this antibiotic, which includes streptomycin, canamycin, neomycin, and some of the related antibiotics, what they do is they also inhibit bacterial protein synthesis. So they use certain groups such as OH groups or NH2 groups to bind to the bacterial ribosome and that will block protein synthesis and kill the bacteria. So how can that bacteria fight back, like we mentioned in the previous slides, by capping or modifying those groups that the antibiotic would use to bind to the ribosome? So if the bacteria can now cap the OH groups or NH2 groups with acetyl groups or phosphates or somehow modify these groups, these OH and NH2 groups, that antibiotic can no longer bind to the bacteria's ribosome. It can no longer block protein synthesis, so the bacteria survives. Okay, so whenever you hear aminoglycosides, think resistance by modifying those binding groups, okay, modifying the binding groups, okay, and this can include, again, addition of phosphate, AMP, or acetyl groups, so that the antibiotic can no longer attach to the bacteria's ribosome. The last resistance to mention is the one that I said was my favorite, and that is tetracycline resistance. Now again, the first thing you have to ask yourself, how does this antibiotic work to kill bacteria? Well, what tetracycline does is it's yet another one that inhibits protein synthesis. Now, what the bacteria in this case does to protect itself against the tetracycline is it has a transport pump. So remember, this is efflux pumping. So as the tetracycline is brought into the cell, the cell then keeps pumping it out. And it's able to do that because it contains R plasmids, meaning resistance plasmids, with genes that have produced special pumps or channels on their outer membranes. And so they can actively pump out the tetracycline so that that antibiotic never reaches a toxic level. Okay, it stays low in the bacteria and they don't get killed by it. Now the last, now the last thing I want to cover is the take home message. Okay, and to once again remind you that the overuse and misuse of broad spectrum antibiotics is a huge problem. Okay, and to draw out why this is again, okay, to really reinforce what I've been saying this whole time, I've made a diagram on the next slide. Make sure to pause at some point and draw this diagram in your notes so that you have the take home message of antibiotic resistance, which is that in your body normally, you'll have a whole bunch of normal flora, which we represent here in blue. And scattered throughout, there'll be some resistant potential pathogens, but right now they can't do much because the normal flora is all over the place, taking up space, taking up resources. Now, what happens when you then pump antibiotics into that patient? Well, the normal flora that was not resistant to that antibiotic have now been killed off and only the resistant potential pathogens survive. Now, what do you notice they can do? Boom, they now have all the space and resources to replicate, replicate, replicate. And now they flourish and they pass on to each of these offspring that resistance, right? Because that's how bacteria replicate, they're dividing themselves. So the offspring will be identical to them, okay? So now they have the chance to reproduce and pass on that resistance. Okay, so again, keep in mind when you hear overuse of antibiotics or misuse, think of the fact that it's killing off normal flora. So the resistant pathogens now have a chance to flourish 
and pass on their resistance, okay? Notice there was no mutations occurring here, no, you know, strengthening of the bacteria themselves. They were already strong. They were already resistant. We just gave them the ideal environment to pass on that resistance and to flourish. That is it for today. I hope you got something very valuable out of this lesson. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact me in the Remind app, day or night. Like I always say, I have no life, so I do not mind. Thank you and have a great day.